I want to start by sharing with you just a little bit why we're going back as Calvary Chapel, as a church, we're going back to the life of Jesus, and once again, we're giving it a really hard, hopefully raw, hopefully unfiltered look, this time in the book of Mark. Why are we doing this again? We were just in the book of John less than two years ago. It's been a long time in the book of John. This is Flora just uh, uh, shared with us. It's just filled with the life of Christ. Why are we going right back in again? Uh, why are we doing that? And, and to do that, I want to, believe it or not, I want to go outside uh, uh, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which are about the life of Christ. And I want to go to Philippians. If you would take your Bibles and go to Philippians. If you don't have a Bible, by the way, you can go back to the back and just pick up a Bible and come to your seat. Totally fine if you want to do that. But go to the book of Philippians. So that's to the right, oh, about 150 pages. And I'm going to read a little bit here from, the, from Philippians. And again, why are we going back to the life of Christ, this time in the book of Mark, and giving it a really hard study again here at Calvary Chapel. Philippians chapter 3. Now this is Paul. This is Paul. And he's going to describe right now. He's going to describe in the next, I don't know, eight or nine verses. What happened to him after he met and studied and went deep getting to know who Jesus Christ was. He says in, in the middle of verse 4, if anyone thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. In other words, if anyone can boast about their religious experience, their religious upbringing, I can beat them with my history is what he's saying there. Verse 5. I was circumcised the eighth day. That was a requirement in the Mosaic law. Of the stock of Israel. So he's saying, I'm the stock of Israel. I, I'm, I'm a pure blood Jew. Of the tribe of Benjamin. A Hebrew of the Hebrews concerning the law, a Pharisee, meaning very meticulously, with great detail, following everything about the law. Verse 6, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. And so, so what he's saying here, it, 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 if, if I could just put this in sort of modern language, what he's saying here is it, it's, it would be like if, if I said, you know, I, I grew up in the church. My parents were leaders in the church. I was a model Sunday school kid. I was an altar boy. I was an, or, or a woman would say, I'm an, I was an altar girl. I was confirmed in the church. I, I, I was, man, when they did those uh, Bible memorization verses, I did better than anybody else. And in terms of my walk with God, I didn't lie, I didn't cheat, I didn't steal, I didn't smoke weed, I was, I was sexually pure. But what Paul is saying is, though all those things can be good, they oftentimes in the church of God are nothing more of a facade of a person growing up in the church or in a, a religious tradition where inside they don't know Jesus Christ. 
And, and so that's why he says in the next verse, these things were gained to me that I have counted lost for Christ. Then continue in verse 8, yet indeed I also count all these things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Now, skip over to verse 10, that I might know him. And so what he is saying is that all this religious stuff that I had, which was for me nothing more than a front Growing up in Sunday school, model, well-behaved Sunday school student, or in the service, or, or it, 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 an altar boy, it, it, at the, um, even after whatever, graduating from high school, I did all the right stuff. I went to the college Bible study. I, I did this, but I did not know Christ. It was nothing more than external. Well, right now, I count all that stuff that was nothing more than external religion like rubbish. A lot of translations say like dung, poop, that I might what? Verse 10 says, know him. Know Jesus Christ. That word know, K-N-O-W, is the same word used in Luke chapter 1 when the angel of God came and told Mary she was pregnant and she said, how is that possible? I have never known a man. So not the greatest translation into English. We don't really have a word for it. Gnosko in the Greek. It is an intimacy, a knowledge of the person. Listen, Calvary Chapel, it's the same word that in I think Mark 7 those who have been appointed for eternal hell, they come to Jesus and they say, why? He says, I never knew you. K-N-E-W, gnosko, same word as verse 10. And Paul is saying that I count all my religious background as dung, as rubbish for the excellency of, of knowing Jesus, talking here about a relationship with God that came, came about by coming to know the real Jesus, not just facts about Jesus. Now, I, I, I want to make a really, really quick uh, qualification that there are three and four-year-olds that know Christ from the very beginning right up until the time they die when they're whatever, 80 or 90 or whatever age. Not talking about that situation. I'm just talking about that religious front that most people put on in either churches that teach the Bible or in my case, it was churches that didn't teach the Bible when I grew up. And it's, there's nothing, it's just an external thing and inside there's no knowledge of Jesus Christ, meaning there's no relationship with him. This is why we're taking a deep dive back into the study of the life of Christ. It's my prayer. It's my strong desire, not only of me, but of the elder board and the leadership of this church, that as we make our way through the book of Mark, that reading about what Jesus did for you and what he says to you, you will grow by leaps and bounds in your relationship with him. And as you get to know him better and better by what we read here in the book of Mark, that you would grow in your relationship with Christ so that everything else in your life, every, including not only the religious stuff, but just every, everything else, your the the, your career, your, your relationships, uh, your, um, your hobbies, the entertainment, whatever, will be as rubbish. Doesn't mean you don't like them. Doesn't mean the, uh, that you won't enjoy them. But you will just get to know Jesus so well that everything will just pale in comparison to the point there. It's almost like they're rubbish because you love Jesus so much. Calvary Chapel 
I'm telling you, as you open up your heart to God, as you get out of your self-absorbed bubble, which I live a good part of my life in, and you pop that bubble and you get to know God, you start talking to know God and you read his word and you pray that word right back to him, it'll happen. Before we go on, get, get into Mark, I just also want to bring um, in this verse from Matthew chapter 13, um, it, it, this is what it says, Matthew 13 verse 44. And again, what, I'm just beginning today as to why we're taking, going back again relatively soon and studying the life of Jesus. Studying the life of Jesus. Matthew 13, 44 says again, the king, this is Jesus speaking. The kingdom of God is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid. And listen, this is, these next four words are the most important. And for the joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and he buys that field. It, it, it's my prayer and strong de desire that as we make our way through the book of Mark, that reading about what Jesus did for you, reading about what he says to you, you by growing leaps and bounds in your relationship um, with him, that your joy, the joy that develops uh, in time as you, you get to know Christ more and more, that the, your joy over the Lord will be so great that you will go and you'll sell everything you have. Can we have that verse again? Everything that you have in order to live out the kingdom of the kingdom life with Jesus. And all that you have, and whatever that means for you, whether it means literally selling everything you have, or, or whether it means just giving up a career or taking some crazy risk in ministry or life that seems reckless to the world in order to pursue the kingdom life with Jesus. We live in a world where it abounds, just a compromised, watered-down Life with Jesus. Life with Jesus is always 100% of the time radical. <laughs> Radically raising your kids as a mom in a way that you never dreamed you would raise your kids like when you thought about having kids. That is a way of selling Everything you have. I don't care what anyone else says. This is how the Bible says I raise my kids. I'm going to do it. It'll happen as you get to know Jesus, as you devour this book, the book of Mark, with us. So let's go. Let's start in Mark chapter 1, if you could just go back there. Um, we began this morning with verse 7 that says this, He, John the Baptist, preached, saying, There comes one after me. who is mightier than I. Whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. I indeed baptize you with water. But he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Okay, now this is huge. Follow me here. Just as the Old Testament prophets had prophesied, John the Baptist came on the scene. He's announcing the coming of the Son of God into human history. His message was summed up for us in verse 3. If you go back to verse 3 of Mark chapter 1, which we read last week, it says, prepare the way of the Lord. That was his main message, crying out, prepare the way of the Lord. He's coming. You haven't seen him yet? He's coming. Really soon. 
And that's what John the Baptist did. He prepared the people for the coming of Jesus Christ who was coming imminently, any minute. And it says in verse 4 of the same chapter, he came baptizing in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance, of repentance. Um, so when he says in Mark 1, verse 8, he says, I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Um, he is saying, the baptism I give you is one to prepare you for the Son of God by repenting. Before the Son of God comes, or when you come to the Son of God, you need to come with a heart of repentance, meaning doing a U-turn, whatever direction you were going. Um, it, 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 as my son, Sam, taught recently, uh, going from the way of me to the way of God. And, and, and so he's saying, the baptism I give you is one to prepare you for the Son of God, but his baptism that he's going to give you, that the Son of God's going to give you, quite literally, you will be given the Son of God himself. He will come upon you and into you by the person of the Holy Spirit. Again, verse 8, I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. If you are here really wanting to get to know who Jesus is, please give Get this. Jesus sought you out. He saved you. And when he saved you, he gives you all of himself. That is how much he loves you. That is how much he wants you. He gives you all of himself. The word baptism, when, it, when John says, I baptize you with water, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. That word baptize, in the Greek, it's immerse. That's why when we baptize people, we put them underneath the water. It's, it's immerso, the Greek word, which means immersion, which means underneath. When you are baptized by the Holy Spirit, you are being immersed. You're getting all of Jesus. You're getting immersed in Jesus he will, I baptize you with water. He will baptize you with all of himself. On the night Jesus was crucified, speaking of the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Jesus said this in John 14, 18. He said, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm, not, I'm leaving now, but I'm not going to leave you as orphans, leave you alone. He, this is a reference. This is the whole context here of John 14, 8 is the coming of the Holy Spirit. He says, don't be so bummed out that I just told you I was coming. He says, many of them were, 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 were so sad. He says, don't be. I'm going to come and I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. And when he gives the Holy Spirit, it's an immersion into the life of Christ. It's, it's like Jesus Christ, all of him, coming upon you. I will baptize with water. He will immerse you with the Holy Spirit. He will immerse you with himself. The Bible says that when Ephesians chapter 1, when a man or woman believes in Jesus, they are given the Holy Spirit. And there's also a promise of a baptism of, this, uh, of, of the Holy Spirit that uh, Christians have. And so he gives you all of himself. He gives you all of himself. That's what it means when he says, the Son of God will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He's going to give you all of you. This water baptism I'm giving you, it's just kind of like it's symbolic of, of being prepared uh, for, for him. But when he baptizes you, he's going to give you all of him. That is what it uh, means. So um, let's go now to uh, verse 9. This is Jesus coming onto the scene. It says, It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and he was baptized by John in the Jordan. He was baptized by John in the Jordan. Now, the question comes up sometimes, uh, why did Jesus have to get baptized when the Bible clearly says that Jesus never sinned? It says in the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, it says that 
Jesus was tempted in every way, as you and I have been tempted, yet without sin. Why is he being baptized here? In fact, in the book of Matthew, John the Baptist himself asked Jesus the very same question. He says, why am, why am I baptizing you? Shouldn't you be baptizing me? Jesus responded by saying what? It must be done to fulfill all righteousness. What he means by that is this. Jesus was baptized in order to fulfill the Old Testament prophecy about himself. The Bible says that the Son of God, the Messiah, would, be, would hold three offices. The, the, the Israel, which the Old Testament really supremely is about the nation of Israel and the leading up to of the, the, the coming of the Messiah, they were ruled by prophets, by kings, prophets, and priests. And in the Old Testament, just prior to getting started um, on their priesthood, right before they started, they couldn't start their priesthood until they were baptized. By Jesus being baptized here, it's an indication to everyone that Messiah the king, the prophet, and the priests, he's come. He's here. Prior to being baptized, people didn't even know who he was. They'd never seen him, other than a small amount of people in Nazareth. But, but here, he just comes right on the scene. He begins his public ministry, and he is baptized. The Bible says Jesus is our high priest who is interceding for us before the Father. That's Hebrews 7.25. Let's go to verse 10. Verse 10 says this. After Jesus was baptized, it says that immediately, coming up from the water, he, Jesus, saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. We're going to finish up with this verse. It says, and immediately, coming up from the water, he, Jesus, saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Now, imagine this. Jesus is underneath the water. He comes up out of the water. Verse 10 says that he looked up in the sky and verse 10 says the heavens Parted. Now, most translations, in fact, some of you, like you who have the NIV, it says the heavens were torn open. They were torn open, or the heavens were split open. The word parting, the heavens parted there in verse 10, is the Greek word schizo, from which we get the word schism, um, sp like a split. It, it, it's the word used in Matthew 27 when there was an earthquake after Jesus died, and it says the rocks split. So imagine Jesus. He's under, the, he, he's under the water. He comes out. He looks up into, the, up into the heaven. The heaven splits open and the Spirit comes down upon him like a dove. Now again, people ask, does this mean that Jesus did not have the Spirit prior to this time? Is that what this means? Some heretics have taught that. The problem with that is what? You got to read the whole Bible. Not just this one verse. And in Luke chapter 2, the story of the Christmas story, remember from the story of Jesus' conception in Luke chapter 1, Mary says that she's never known a man, so how can she be pregnant? And what does the angel say? The angel says what? The Holy Spirit will come upon you, so the one born to you will be the Son of God. Jesus had the Holy Spirit from the time he was conceived. Then, so, okay, what's happening here in verse 9 then? What's happening here? Where he sees the heavens open, split open, and the Holy Spirit coming to, up, down upon him. Well, right, just as we talked about Jesus is beginning for the first time his public ministry, this is an affirmation directly from God that this public ministry has started. And you could say it's a, it's a full accompanying, empowering by the Holy Spirit for the public ministry that he is now about to start. That's why this is happening. So then in verse 11, we read what? 
right as the Holy Spirit is coming upon him, verse 11 says, then a voice from heaven, then a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now, the translation in our New King James, New King James Version really, really, really does not do justice to what is really being communicated. So here, here's the New Living Translation. It says, You are my much-loved son. I am very happy with you. The New Living Translation says this, You are my dearly loved son, and you bring me great joy. This is what God is telling Jesus right as he comes up out of the water. Jesus hears a voice. And, and we know from the book of John that John sees the dove too. And, and, there's, and, and, and there's a sound as well. You are my dearly loved, loved son, and you bring me great joy. That's what Jesus hears as he comes out um, of, of, the, uh, of the water. Now, I'm not just putting these translations up because, oh, it just gives you, me the warm and fuzzies, and it gives you the warm and fuzzies, um, if, uh, that, oh, oh, you know, how, how sweet... That, that God the Father, um, how, 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 that he dearly loves his sons and, and his son gives him great joy, great happiness. I, I'm not just putting there because it sounds so sweet. I, I have too much of a fear of God not to misrepresent his word. If you do a study of the word of God, you will find, I trust, that if, if you do a deep dive into what, into what the underlying words mean, this is what it means. This is the attitude that God has for his son. His son, Jesus Christ, gives him great joy. In a description of Jesus in Isaiah 42, it says this. It says this, verse 1. Behold, this is, this is God the Father speaking of his son. My servant whom I uphold, my elect one, in whom my soul delights. In whom my soul delights. So if we could, Josue, if we could go back to the, to the New Living Translation uh, right there. Why does this matter to you? Why does this matter to me? Why do, should I care? Why should I care that the Father dearly loves the Son? Why should I care that the Father, that the Son gives the Father great joy. Why should you care about that? Well, you should. <laughs> like in a big time way, you should. Why? There's a few reasons. I will go through them quickly. Matthew, cha um, John chapter 7 verse 23 says this. Jesus, right before he dies, he's praying to God his Father. And he says this, he prays that the world would know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Get it? Or so wait, go back to the New Living Translation. You are my dearly loved son and you bring me great joy. The Bible actually says this is how God loves you. We flip back to the verse in John. This is Jesus speaking. He says he's praying that they would know, that, that, that the disciples would know, in fact, the whole world would know that you love, that God loves you as God has loved his son. In other words, he takes great joy in you. He, give, he, he delights in you. Man, if your heart would it would would open up its eyes and understand that God loves you as he loves the Son, equal to loving the Son. It's a strange thing, but the Bible says this. Why else should it matter to you? Why else should you care that God the Fa Father 
loves dearly, is well pleased, is great happiness is found in him with his son. Well, in 1 Corinthians 12, 27, it says this. It says this, now you are the body of Christ and members individually. In other words, um, this church right here is called the body of Christ. So when we gather, when we gather, the Bible says that th that love that, that God has for the Son, we are the body of Son. In fact, in Ephesians, it even says this. Um, he says, we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. That's from uh, Ephesians, I think that's chapter 5. It says, we together are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bone. So when we, when we congregate, and God the Father, he's showing up here. The Bible says he loves us. He loves you. He delights in you. He, you give him great joy. We give him great joy as the body of Christ. Again, when Jesus came up out of the water, when he came up out of the water, he heard, you are my son whom I dearly love. Why should that matter to you? Why should you care about that? There's another reason. Um, John 17, 26 says this. It says this. Jesus again here, he's praying to God the Father. He says, I have declared to them your name and will declare it that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. And so, this, look carefully at, about what this says, Calvary Chapel. At the end of the verse, it says that we will d develop the same love for Jesus as God has for Jesus. So when the Bible says, when, when it says that God delights in his Son, this verse right here says, Jesus is praying for you, and when Jesus prays for you, it goes to the bank that you, as you continue to seek the Lord, as you continue to get out of your self-absorbed bubble, and me too, my self-absorbed bubble, we will develop a love for Jesus, the same love that the Father has for Jesus. You are my dearly loved son. And you bring me great joy. What else? One final thing. Why does it matter to you? Why should you care that God the Father delights in, in, in the Lord Jesus Christ, in his Son? Why is it? Well, John chapter 8, verse 29 says this. Jesus, this is Jesus speaking. He says, I always do those things that please him. Everyone with me? This is Jesus speaking. And what does he say? I always do those things that please my Father. I always do that. Listen, Calvary Chapel. If you're a lover of God, if you're a lover of God, if, you're, if, you are, if you're a lover of God, doesn't it make sense? Doesn't it make, doesn't it make you, you love Jesus all the more knowing that everything that he did, he blessed the heart of God. He pleased God. He made God the Father happy. He made God the Father rejoice. If you're a lover of God, doesn't that make you just want to love Jesus all the more? That everything that he did, he did to please, to make God the Father rejoice. That everything that he did, if you're a lover of God, this will make you love Jesus all the more. And at some point, as your love for Jesus grows, even as your knowledge of him grows, at some point, Everything else is going to smell like dung. It's going to smell like garbage. As you begin to love Jesus, he's the one 
that did everything that he did, he did to please his Father. Oh, Lord Jesus, I love you for doing that. If the worship team could come up, we're going to close at this point. If you could stand now, gonna, I'm just going to close in prayer. I'm going to close in prayer. And I'm going to pray specifically that we would grow in our understanding of why this matters so much. That when Jesus came out of the water. He heard this voice saying, You're my dearly loved son. You bring me great joy. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus. Father, that this would sink in, that this would go deep. That your word says that the same love that you have for your son, when we're adopted as sons, when we're adopted as daughters, you love us the same way. And when we're adopted as sons, as daughters, which your word says that we can do merely with a cry of our heart, that we can love Jesus the way that you loved him. Father, by your spirit, fill us with the Holy Spirit. that we would come to understand that we are the body of Christ. Lord, we have such a low view of ourselves that we have a hard time believing the high view that your scripture says of us, that we're members of the body of Christ. We are his bones, his flesh, Ephesians 5 says. Father, by your Spirit, that this body of believers would understand that I would understand that we would burst with worship, that I would burst with worship with love for you, Lord Jesus, knowing that everything you did, you did to please your Father. Take us to that place, Lord. So that we would count all other things as rubbish as we grow in our knowledge of you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.